Well, hello, everybody, and welcome again to another OpenShift Commons briefing. This time, we have uh, someone um, that we've known for quite a long time, but we haven't been able to get him on, Everett Toes from Deloitte. Um, he is based down under, so the time zone hasn't always been perfect, but we're really happy that you've all joined us um, for this talk, because I think it's going to be very, very interesting. It's a culmination of about a year's worth of work that Everett's been doing. If you have questions, ask them in the chat. Um, we'll turn, um, we'll unmute everybody at the end and you can ask all your questions then. I'll, I'll try and answer anything I can, but doubtful. Um, but I'd like to just let Everett take it away and get started and um, let's hear all about GitOps driven deployments. Yeah, thanks a lot, Diane. I uh, appreciate that. And it's it's great to be speaking here on, on OpenShift. So I wanted to give everyone, um, you know, walk everyone through some some ideas and concepts around uh, GitOps-driven deployments on OpenShift. And as Diane mentioned, this is kind of the, the culmination of uh, a year's about a year's worth of work, a little more actually, at uh, a client uh, I have uh, here working with uh, Deloitte Digital in in New Zealand. So just uh, a quick intro uh, of myself. My name is Everett Caves. I know uh, Taves looks nothing like it sounds. It's okay, I, I get it all the time. Uh, I'm eTaves on GitHub, Twitter, LinkedIn, and, and my blog, uh, where I actually have a, a kind of a summary of this presentation as well. You can reach out to me on, on any of those if you like. Uh, I'm a platform engineer uh, with Deloitte Digital. Uh, Deloitte is a global consulting firm, um, kind of traditionally known for their, their audit and risk and, and financial kind of services, um, but we're moving into uh, tech consulting quite heavily and um, help, uh, helping kind of build this out in, in New Zealand here in Wellington, New Zealand uh, to be particular. And so, yes, I'm in New Zealand. It's Thursday morning at 7.03 a.m., uh, but I'm actually Canadian uh, coming from Canada. So let's get right into it. GitOps. So what, what is GitOps, if, if you're unfamiliar with the term? Uh, really broadly speaking, um, it's like all about applying the Git workflow to operations. You know, that is the, the, the essentially the maintenance of, of applications, uh, you know, running on machines somewhere. Um, you know, and all throughout my career, and, and I would imagine likely yours too, uh, you know, we just keep putting more and more things in source control. Uh, and now Git is kind of the dominant source control uh, uh, system. And, you know, we just keep putting more and more stuff in there. So it's it's really natural to apply, uh, you know, that kind of that, that same workflow to operations as well. So I think kind of more specifically, um, you know, we can kind of narrow the the definition a bit and say, talk about, you know, applying a developer experience to operations. And, you know, most people, when they think of developer experience, they think of APIs and documentation and tutorials and, and all of those things. It, it kind of, uh, developer experience or, or DX kind of rose, became a, a concept uh, and, and, in fact, a, a role, a, a career in, in the industry not so long ago, very much around APIs. But I, I, I actually take take it to mean even something like more more specific that you know the the work we do as developers interacting with git all day um, that's that's part of the developer experience too very much so uh, and so we can apply that to operations as well and so I took this this one use case of applying that to deployments um, at, at a client so let's start at the end um, I want to give you an idea of exactly what this means and, and how it all works. And it's probably not going to make a whole lot of sense, honestly, when you first see it. But then I'm going to go and explain every every piece, every concept. And, and at the, the real end, <laughs> hopefully we'll have a better idea of, of how it all fits together. So here's the flow of how this actually works, how a deployment actually works uh, via GitOps on, on OpenShift. So uh, someone proposes... Uh, a new version of the application via a pull request. When that pull request gets merged, a uh, webhook fires, and the new version is rolled out to an environment. Simple as that. Um, <laughs> of course, 
you know, nothing's ever simple and uh, putting this stuff together, you know, it took some time um, and, and certainly not just the, the technology, but uh, working with all the, the various stakeholders uh, and throughout the whole software development life cycle, um, you know, that, that took as, as much time as anything. So here it is. Uh, this is actually the uh, deployment in action in this uh, Devo3 master, master branches environment. So we're in OpenShift right now, and, and we're looking at some of the pipelines in OpenShift. And again, this isn't going to make a whole lot of sense, um, but I'll just kind of explain bits and pieces here, and, and we'll, we'll dig deep on, on each and every single one of them uh, for the remainder of the presentation. So right now, we're just looking at a, a variety of pipelines. There's actually a couple different types of pipeline here that I'll get into, environment and, and service pipelines. And now we're in Git. And we're looking at the, the Git repositories that contain the, the configuration and versions for an actual environment. That's, that's what's in those properties files. And here's the, the pull request I mentioned, uh, you know, as kind of the, the first step of the flow. And it's really just a, a, a test pull request to, to fire off the webhook so I can demonstrate all this stuff uh, and going ahead and merging it and cleaning up after myself. Um, to keep things tidy. And so that merge fired off a webhook which initiated this pipeline. And so it goes off and, you know, runs these other pipelines. Um, this first one called uh, Deploy Identity Server. And it goes and it does a few steps. Um, you know, the Identity Server is one of the, the services in this application stack. And then it goes ahead and verifies that, that the identity server has been deployed and it initiates the next pipeline, um, you know, in the process. And again, it, a very similar set of steps and it rolls out and gets verified once again. And there's, there's some optimizations in the pipelines, uh, which is why this is all happening so quickly. This is all real time at the moment. Um, uh, and, and all of this stuff has already been built. So there's no actual uh, container image builds and the optimizations just kind of, you know, skip a bunch of steps uh, if, if they aren't really necessary. Uh, deploying the UI involves a linting step. So there's a uh, time-lapse here, uh, not to, so as to not bore everybody with linting. Um, and then, but again, a, a very similar set of steps for the, the user interface uh, portion of this stack. So all those have rolled out. And there's a, a final verification step and our pipeline run uh, has completed successfully. And so we can go look at all of our uh, pods running within our environment. There's just a, a handful here, three, three services in the stack. And that's it. That was a GitHub driven deployment on OpenShift. Okay, so, you know, that kind of went through that at, at breakneck speed. Let's zoom out a bit and kind of, uh, you know, then start zooming back into the, the various different areas, starting with uh, the stack that uh, we rolled out there, that we deployed there. Um, so, actually, something that, that wasn't part of that stack necessarily uh, that we saw in the video is uh, an API gateway, and that's actually running on uh, the Azure cloud, Microsoft's Azure cloud. Um, so we're using that to front the, the API for this, this stack. Then there's the, the user interface that's actually running on on-premise on on a in a data center on OpenShift. And, and when I say it's, it's running, um, it's actually being served up from uh, OpenShift on-prem. The API itself is, very much running uh, on-prem on OpenShift. Uh, there's an identity server portion um, service which does uh, authentication, again, running on on-prem and on OpenShift. And then underlying the whole thing is this, this great big monolithic database. Uh, and that's actually a part of, uh, that, that was a pre-existing database uh, running on, on a separate uh, set of hardware. And that's not on OpenShift. So here's kind of a, a very basic diagram of, of what's going on there. Uh, you know, you, a, a user comes in via their web browser, they, you know, hit a URL to load up the UI, that, that user interface is downloaded from a, a web server, uh, which contains all the UI code. It's a single page application uh, written in Angular uh, using TypeScript. 
or I should say written in TypeScript using Angular. Um, and then it does some uh, authentication via the identity server, uh, which reaches into the, the database to get to, you know, to actually do the authentication. Uh, and then after that, it's that, that single page application uh, making API calls through the Azure API gateway to our API code. And again, of course, that's, that's hitting the, the monolithic database. So all told, honestly, it's, it's you know, a relatively, conceptually certainly, uh, a, a simple application stack. So let's, let's talk about that, that flow in a little more detail. Um, you know, of course, you always have your, your users. In our case, uh, for, for deployments, our users are internal, right? We have these uh, environment owners um, who work through Git uh, to actually take those, to, you know, initiate the pull requests and to, to accept and merge the, the pull request, I, I should say, approve and, and merge the, the pull requests, uh, which, of course, fires off the, the pipelines um, that we saw running in the video. And then everything is deployed out to an environment, which is actually just an OpenShift project. Um, you know, if you're kind of intimately familiar with OpenShift, which I imagine you are since you're watching this video. Okay, so that's that's a, a little deeper uh, into the flow. Let's, let's start touching on each of those uh, particular components. And, and this is the, the whole thing end to end what we watched in, in the video. And again, it, it's far too complicated to explain in one go. So we'll, we'll carve it up and, and explain a bit at a time, starting with Git. Um, so this is, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm just gonna go ahead and, and assume you know what Git is. Uh, you know, if you're, you're interested enough to be actually, uh, you know, taking your time to watch this present, presentation, you've probably got a, a good, good hold on what Git is. It's, it's a source control system. Um, okay, so the user interacts with Git to, you know, merge that, that pull request, um, which kicks off a pipeline, which, you know, fires the webhook and that kicks off a pipeline. They, they can, in fact, users can, in fact, go ahead and, and start the pipeline manually. Um, you know, they can, if they have the, the right permissions in OpenShift, they can go to that pipeline screen and click the start pipeline button and, and kick things off. Um, and, you know, all, all throughout, all of these pipelines, you know, it's the, the pipelines are, are regularly interacting with Git, pulling in config or pulling in source code or, or pulling in uh, different artifacts um, like deployment configurations or config maps, uh, things of that nature. Um, but for, for the purposes of, of users interacting with it, you know, they're, they're very much uh, interacting with the, the Git user interface, which in our case is, is Bitbucket. So, you know, there's Git provides uh, a lot of great features um, that, you know, we probably all kind of take for granted and, and have all kind of faded into the background for us, um, but are, are super useful in, for, for this sort of work actually, um, you know, because they, they provide all this great access control and auditability out of the box. Um, and, you know, this is the sort of thing that, you know, a lot of organizations aren't even used to having. It, you know, it takes a lot to actually get these things when really you, you get them for basically for free um, out of the box with, uh, you know, whatever Git system it is you're using. Uh, you know, you, for, for those repos, uh, the environment repos and such, which I'll explain a, a bit more, uh, you know, you want to make sure you've got your, your permission set properly, branch permission set properly. Uh, your, your pull requests and your viewers set on your environment repo properly uh, and, and the webhooks as well, which actually fire off um, and, and initiate the pipeline run. And then for the, the what I term the, the service repos, tags are kind of the, the important bit. So these are all the, the aspects of Git that, that I rely on to, to bring this system together. And I'll explain, um, you know, kind of what environment repos are and, and service repos are in, in just a bit here. So uh, the environment repos, these are all of the, the various uh, software development lifecycle environments that are you know, important to this particular client for this particular application. Uh, and you know, they, they, there's a naming convention here that I'll explain in a bit, um, but they're, they're your basic stuff, your, your development environments, your test environments, there's uh, a, even a demo environment and some lab stuff, pre-prod, prod, prod um, 
and all of these things describe the, the various environments. Uh, and the, the sandbox ones there, those are actually for uh, the, the operation people uh, ourselves where we can go and basically break things without breaking everybody else. Uh, that's, that's the purpose of those ones. So if we take a look into one of these environments, in, in this case, Devo3 Master, we just see just two, two files, that's it. Um, relatively simple. The, the service.properties contains uh, the, the configuration that, um, you know, that, that goes into the applications themselves. Uh, you know, the, these are C Sharp applications and are configured with some, some JSON files. And those basically act as parameters into those configuration files, the, the contents of service.properties. And then version.properties, those are the versions of the various services that are, are being deployed. So in, in our case, there's only three entries in that file, one for the UI, one for the identity server, and one for the, the API. And they just specify a, a Semver style version that, that tells the system what to deploy, what version of that service to deploy. So let's let's look at the permissions on, on those environment repos. Um, you know, you, you set the user access, um, you want the admin access for the environment owner, uh, the person who uh, basically approves uh, the, the pull request coming in and accepts a new version into their environment. Um, you want to give right access to those who can update the environment, the people who are proposing the pull request. You know, I want a new version of the API and test 07. And they'll propose that pull request and the admin uh, the end owner will, you know, either uh, approve it or reject it and, and merge the pull request or not. Uh, and then, you know, you can set up group access as well if you want. Um, you know, maybe you want everybody to, to be able to read the, the service dot properties so they can understand what, uh, you know, what the services are pointed to, what database, for instance, the, the services are pointed to in a particular environment. Uh, branch permissions. I'll, I'll just run through some of this stuff pretty quickly because it's you know pretty basic stuff um, for for managing Git. So you want to set up uh, some master branch permissions around preventing a bunch of bad things from happening, um, and, and certainly changes without a pull request. For pull requests and and default reviewers, uh, this stuff is actually pretty pretty important. Um, you know because you want to make sure that people just can't willy nilly um, you know, put stuff into environment without people being notified. And so you, you set up some uh, approvers and, and default reviewers. And this actually also has the added benefit of kind of working as the, the notification system um, for, for this style of deployment. Because when you initiate a pull request, all of the default reviewers get an email. And so they know that someone is, you know, wants to deploy a new version into their environment and they can act uh, act accordingly. And of course, you, you're gonna want more than uh, <laughs> at least one uh, approver for your, your PRs. Okay, so the, the web hooks, um, you know, you can figure these in Git as well. You've got a URL, which I'll, I'll show you where you get that URL for the web hook um, in, in OpenShift, uh, active of course. And then when you want, when, when do you actually want the web hook to fire? In our case, it's it's simply when the, the pull request is merged, when the admin, when the environment owner has uh, approved it and actually merged it, then the the webhook will fire and that will initiate the, the pipeline run. And you can find that webhook uh, within OpenShift in the actual pipeline configuration. So uh, for instance, this is the, the Devo3 master uh, deployment pipeline, and you just go into the configuration. And in our case, we're using Bitbucket. Uh, so we grab the Bitbucket webhook. Um, but of course, this, this works with you know, many systems. And, and you can always use the, the generic uh, webhook URL as well if, it, you know, if, if your particular uh, Git system isn't necessarily specifically sp supported. Okay, so that was the, the environment repos, the repos that contain all of our environment configuration and um, and the versions of the applications, the versions of the services uh, that are running in the environment. So now uh, we've got the, the service 
repositories of the service repos, these contain the application code, the service code. Um, and in this case, uh, you know, in this particular BitBub, Bitbucket project, it's got two of them, um, EdPay services, which is the, the API, uh, and the identity server, which is that that authentication service, the the UI is actually in a, a different project, so it's not not textured here. And these are just your basic source code repo. There's you know really nothing special about it in particular. Um, and and these happen to be C sharp applications, you know, in in the the .NET world. Uh, you know, this is all running on, um, you know, in in Linux, in in pods and stuff. Uh, but it's all written in in C sharp. Uh, and and these repositories contain you know it's it's like 99% uh, you know C sharp or TypeScript or or what have you for for whatever the service is. They also contain um, you know config maps for that particular service um, that that drive the configuration on OpenShift for that service and also the deployment configuration for that service. Those are, those are contained within the the repository themselves as well. Okay, so the, the service repos, kind of the, the key bit in, in the service repos are the tags. So when we wanna deploy a particular version of a service, we go ahead and we tag it in the master branch in Bitbucket here. So, you know, uh, and we, we typically do this through the UI, but you can do it through the, the command line interface as well, the Git uh, CLI as well. We go in and, and we tag a version we specify it in that versions.properties file I uh, showed earlier, and it gets built by the system. And I'll explain that in a bit too, because it's part of the pipelines. So the, the pipelines, I like to term the pipelines as the interface to the OpenShift container platform. Um, you know, kind of in, in one end comes the configuration and source code, and and out the other end is deployments and uh, image uh, container images, right? And uh, the deployments running based on those container images. So for for kind of day to day work, I, I like to you know focus or, or or try to get across the fact that you know these this is basically your interface to the platform uh, in in some sense. So. You know, just as we had uh, environment repos, we have environment pipelines, and they've got this naming convention, and it's all kind of about the the database. The Devo three is is the database, so that's what we we focus on, and, and master is um, the the branch we're working from in, in this particular case. Uh, there are all those individual Git repos which have the the versions and the configuration. That's that versions dot properties and, and service dot properties I showed you. Uh, and the environment pipelines invoke the the service pipelines, so they're you know the kind of sub pipelines that actually deploy the various services. And after it's invoked those uh, service pipelines, it goes ahead and it verifies the deployments that the the service pipelines made. And so that's the in in this particular case, it just happens to sort to the top uh, just based on its name. Um, and it, you know, it invokes the pipelines below it. And, you know, from the diagram, that's the, the kind of the leftmost pipeline. And as you can see, it, it invokes the pipelines uh, to the right and then does a, a verification step. Okay, so the, the service pipelines, those pipelines, you know, a little further to the right that are invoked by the environment pipeline. Uh, again, uh, following a naming convention of deploy the service, uh, this example, the, the the user interface, and then there's one for the identity server and one for the API as well. Um, and you know these are the the Git repos that that I showed you uh, for the the service repos. It's got the source code. Now these pipelines invoke builds and deployments, so they are actually responsible for you know, running the, the builds that create the container images, the immutable container images for, uh, you know, for the, the deployments, for the pods to actually run. And what's, what's essentially happen, happening here when, when those deployments happen, uh, you know, it's, it's, a little, it's a little more complicated than this, but this is kind of the, the essential bit of it. 
is that we have a, a template in OpenShift for this service. And part of that temp, one of the things that's parameterized in that template is the application version. And so when we, we process the template, we pass in the application version from that version.properties file and apply that for OpenShift, you know, for, for the particular environment, um, you know, that, that we're using, uh, that we're deploying to, I should say. So we leave it up to OpenShift to decide whether or not to actually do the deployment. So if, you know, someone's only changing the version of, say, the API, you know, they're going from 1.2.3 to 1.2.4, um, but the other versions of the, the user interface and the identity server stay the same, we still run the same code. We still apply um, the, the exact same thing for the identity server and the, the API. Um, and those just, they stay the same, you know, because um, they're, they're already at their desired state. Um, and, and only the, the version that changed actually gets changed in OpenShift and deployed. And these are the, you know, in, in terms of the, the OpenShift user interface, these are the, the pipelines on the pipeline screen. And they're the, the pipelines kind of right most in that are, that are invoked by the, the environment pipeline. Okay, so uh, touching on the, the builds of the actual container images, these are managed by build configs in OpenShift. Uh, and again, kind of a similar naming convention as the services. Uh, naturally, they're immutable images. We're actually using the, the source to image uh, piece from OpenShift. We didn't actually start there. Uh, we started with Docker files um, using the, the Docker, Docker strategy for the builds. Um, but then eventually we, we switched it up to, to source to image to kind of bring down our, our image sizes uh, somewhat. And it's, it's been working, uh, working pretty well, really. And here's what it looks like in OpenShift. We've just got the, the three builds for the three services. These are build configs. So now the environments, um, you know, we can describe these as a, a combination of the, the services uh, that, that we're running, those three services we're, we're running and the configuration all bundled up into an OpenShift project. So that's what, what we term an environment. Um, and, you know, like the, the main thing again is what particular database that a service is pointed to. That's kind of the, the big thing. So they, there's a Devo3 database. And if the, the environment or the, the services in the environment are pointed at that database, then, you know, really that's the thing. Uh, Devo3, it's, it's very kind of database centric in terms of, uh, what's, what's most important to, to this application. Uh, so this was the, the services in this environment, the, the three services with their, their running pods. Here's the config maps, uh, one, one config map per service. Um, that's, that's just how this, you know, particular, these particular services work. They only need one. Uh, and then of course, we also have a, a number of secrets for, for the databases, the database connection strings, um, and, and a handful of other secrets to other services that, that integrate with this application. And naturally you're not sharing any of that. Uh, and then there's the, so, so you know, in general, we, we've got all these environments, you know, there's that, that dozen or so environments. And I split those up into kind of conceptually two types of environments. Uh, there's your, your build slash dev environments. And then there's everything else, essentially, your, your higher environments. So, so talking about the, the build slash dev environments here, uh, again, very database centric for this application. So we have the, the database and then the, the version of the environment. And, and in, we do builds and deploys in, in these environments. Um, and it's the, the build bit that kind of distinguishes uh, these, these particular environments. Okay, so master, what is, that doesn't even kind of make sense as a version. And it might have been a bit of a misnomer by me early on, um, but it's stuck and I'm just not going to change it now at this point. Uh, so by master, uh, what I what I really mean here is it's actually the head commit of master for this environment. 
So what's what's being deployed to this Devo3 environment, so that means that all the services are pointed at this Devo3 database, is the head commit of the, the master branch. So it's the, the latest and greatest of all of these services, all the, the most recent code. It, it might all work together or it might not. It's just a, a environment to do really early integration of all the services and, and see if anything's even working. It's this, you know, bubbling cauldron of source code, um, you know, and whether it works or not, you know, you might you might reach in and, and pull out some magic or you might reach in and you might not even have a hand uh, coming out. It could be totally broken. Uh, there's also a Devo3 stable uh, environment where that's where the, the first place where images start getting built with actual versions, you know, based on those tags we saw earlier um, from the, the service repos. And that's where, where things start actually getting kind of ironed out uh, in order to be promoted into the higher environments. Uh, and so that's kind of uh, what the uh, build, so what, what we've actually been looking at uh, this whole time is a build slash dev environment with this, this kind of large complicated uh, series of pipelines. Um, that's just one kind of environment. The other kind of environment is the higher environments, which is everything above those environments in the, the software development lifecycle. So your test, your demo, your pre-prod, even your prod. And these are, are much simpler. They're really just kind of focused on the, the database the, and that they take that for their, their naming convention. And these environments only do deployments. And, and really prod is just another higher environment. Um, kind of the things that that really only distinguish prod from the other environments is that it's actually on a totally different OpenShift cluster uh, running in a different data center, in fact. Um, and it's it's much more isolated. And so all we have to do is uh, copy over the image that we want to deploy. So the, the versions are still specified in that version.properties file, but there's an extra step the, in the, the pipeline, the prod pipeline, to do a, a copy of the image from the non-prod cluster. Uh, and we use that, that Scopio utility in order to, to copy the image over to the production cluster. And then everything else is the same as any of the other higher environments. Um, but of course, uh, prod has much more restricted access uh, and, and fewer people have rights to even look at the thing. And so here's the higher environment pipeline much simpler because it doesn't have to invoke those service pipelines, which do the builds. Instead, the higher environments only do deployments. And so they can just rapidly run through the deployments of, of things that have already been built because we're of course using the, the immutable uh, container images that we, we had built in the lower environments. And that's it, uh, you know, running through uh, the our flow again. We have a new version proposed via pull request. We have a web hook that fires on merge and a new version rolls out. So let's see if if this video makes a little more sense to us now. So now we're working in our, our Devo3 master environment. So it's it's pointed at the Devo3 database. We'll we'll go to our pipelines just to kind of review our pipelines again. Here's our environment pipeline, the deploy Devo3 master pipeline. Here's our first service pipeline our second service pipeline for the UI, our third service pipeline for the identity server. And now we'll, we'll dive into Git here. So here's our environment repositories. And we're changing a version in Devo3 master for this little demo. Uh, it was version.properties that, you know, that, that would be updated if you want to, to change the version of a service, but this is just uh, kind of testing out the webhook here. So this is the, the pull request. Normally you'd get an approval, but I just kind of needed to test it out. So I go ahead and self-merge, self-high-five, uh, and, and merge the PR. And that fires off the webhook, which initiates this pipeline run automatically. And the environment pipeline starts invoking the, the service pipelines, starting with the identity server. And it goes ahead and checks out the source code, reads that configuration, that environment configuration from the environment repository, uh, and you know, parameterizes the deployment. 
uh, via that template, uh, including the version like I like I talked about before. The, the next pipeline it invokes is the API, this EdPay services pipeline. Uh, again, all these images were, were already built, so it just kind of zooms through everything. Um, and then finally, it invokes the, the user interface pipeline um, as, our, as the final service we deploy. And we actually deploy these things uh, sequentially just for kind of sanity's sake, let's say. Uh, conceivably, you know, we could parallelize all of this, um, but it's it's small enough that we can just keep it sequential and it still runs in a, a reasonable amount of time um, and just kind of keeps things uh, a, a little more sane. Uh, and again, the, the UI rolls out after some linting and the environment pipeline does its final verification. Actually, since we've, uh, since I took this video, we've even added in a, a smoke test uh, step where it actually you know, uses a headless browser to log in and, and test it out. So now we can see our running services here uh, in our environment, and that's it. That's our GitOps driven deployment on OpenShift. So, um, you know, like, like we said at the outset, this was the kind of the culmination of a, a year of work. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of things that you know never got around to, or, or you know things I would have done differently, and that's that's kind of what these are. So never really got around to having a, a good story for local development um, on OpenShift. You know the the developers uh, for the for the most part, with maybe the exception of of one or, or two, aren't actually running OpenShift locally. They're not using Minishift or anything like that to do their development they're just kind of doing their development as you normally would within an ide and then you know committing it to to bitbucket and then it you know actually starts getting rolled out on the clusters and honestly it actually it works reasonably well um it's the it's, it's not so complicated that you know we need um that that having a like a slightly higher fidelity development environment is is kind of holding us back um pretty much able to get on with things um, without it, but it, it certainly would have been nice to have kind of OpenShift running on, on their desktops or laptops. Uh, so like, as you saw, we had like almost uh, a, a dozen environments there, which is which is a fair amount, I think, for for a single application, honestly. Uh, you know, normally you're, you're maybe used to having dev tests, staging and prod, um, but there's like a dozen environments in there and there's for, for all sorts of legacy reasons. Um, that, that they wanted that stuff. Uh, so in order to actually have all of those environments and, and keep them maintainable, um, we actually had to get a little bit clever with things, um, you know, which which has a which is a basically a trade off essentially. Um, you know, we we inline Jenkins files in a lot of places. Uh, you know, we've got a, a library for some of the the factored out pipeline code, and it's you know just if you, if you were to naively come to the system and look at it, it might actually be kind of, it, it would take you some time to really understand how things are wired together. We've got a fair amount of documentation that goes along with it. Um, and honestly, this this presentation fell out of that documentation. Um, but it's it's a little more complex than I might necessarily like, but that the, the trade-off there is we actually, it's, it's more maintainable for us as, as operations. Um, even though it is uh, uh, maybe a little more complex and there's some kind of invisible wires running through the thing. Uh, you know, OpenShift by default doesn't uh, deal with divergence. You know, if, if we go in and hand jam something into an environment, you know, uh, we don't have anything that, that comes along and kind of remediates that uh, or, or detects divergence. We have to remember to undo that, that hand jam change. And honestly, it, it, it has its pluses, its pros and cons, pluses and minuses. Um, that we we can we can hand jam stuff and and experiment and try things out and and test things out. Um, but which is which is great. But also, if if we don't remember to undo that stuff, it can it can bite us later, and and certainly has. Um, and there's there's also no automatic rollback. Uh, you know, within the pipelines, if something actually goes wrong, it's a matter of uh, changing the versions again, rolling back the, the versions by hand, and, and rerunning the pipeline, and that that hasn't turned out to be a, a big burden at all. Um, you know, we the the occasional pipeline failure that we get 
typically requires some sort of human intervention anyway uh, that you know we need to look at what aired out and why and and understand it and you know remediate it and so we we need to click the button or or revert the versions anyway so that that hasn't been a big issue for us either and and versioning like all the things like I I, I can't um, express this enough uh, you know we we version the of course, the the container images, the the repos, um, all the configuration, like the the configuration of the services themselves, the deployment configs, we we version the environments themselves, um, so that we can you know roll out the environments through the 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 versions of the environments through through the various different environments as well, because honestly the the environment is just another application dependency. There's all sorts of tweaks we have to make to, to the environment to, to get the application to run, you know, when it has to access uh, different resources uh, across the network and whatnot. And so, you know, versioning the environment lets us um, kind of sanely roll or, or roll out, you know, the, the different environment versions uh, through all of them and um, to understand exactly what changes are, are what in, in what environment. So what would I do uh, differently on this sort of system? Um, it's it's actually a really wide open system, um, and you know when I when I first presented it uh, to the client, uh, you know it was re really pretty open ended. You could you could slice and dice the workflow quite a number of ways, and that that's really great. Um, but it's also kind of daunting, right? Um, I, I think I could have been more prescriptive uh, about how to actually use the system, or at least one good way to use the system. Uh, like we, we we finally wound up settling on something really good that worked for for everyone I think, um, and and will continue to work in the long run. But it it took m honestly months to get there, um, and I think I could have been more prescriptive at the outset. Uh, I, I probably would have done an OpenShift project dedicated just to builds. I had kind of I munged the the uh, the build and the dev environments together, um, and that was I don't know it it works it's fine, but I I think. You know, next time around, I'd probably have something dedicated to builds. Uh, right now, this thing is, you know, kind of tailored to, honestly, a pretty small uh, application stack, just just the three services. Um, you know, if if we wanted to onboard more applications, more developers, um, you know, or or more config, or you know, some um, caught software, some uh, commercial off the shelf stuff, you know, might have to kind of make a number of changes to to really get the thing to scale. Uh, I, I'm aware of uh, quite a bit of related work in, in this space. Uh, when, when I first started building out this system, uh, Jenkins X was, was kind of in its infancy. Uh, and I, honestly, I, I wasn't even really aware of what it did. I had heard of it, but I, I, had, I had no idea what it was. It just kind of heard of it in passing. And then, you know, uh, as, as I, I built the system, uh, and it was kind of wrapping it up. Jenkins X had matured to a point where it was getting kind of uh, getting pretty usable. And, and I realized that it, actually pretty darn similar, um, you know, which was actually kind of vindicating for me um, that, you know, kind of on the right track with some of this stuff uh, because Jenkins X does some qu qu quite a few similar things to this. Uh, so I think that that warrants another work, uh, sorry, <laughs> warrants another look. Um, Weaveworks uh, kind of, um, you know, I don't, I don't know if they necessarily coined the term GitOps, uh, but they certainly popularized it uh, with a couple of blog, blog posts early on. And really, that was only two or three years ago. Uh, this this other uh, company, Container Solutions, has has got some great posts on it um, that that are quite informative. Uh, and then there's this uh, article. Uh, actually, this is kind of closer to an academic paper on GitOps and how you could use it more generally. So, so what, what I did here was for just for deployments and that's it. Um, but, but this paper describes how to do it kind of for a more general, as a more general IT service um, and, and making it much more self-service, which I thought was really cool and, and kind of the sorts of ideas that, that should really start advancing and, and be, I wanna say they're, they're an area just, just ripe for development, which is, which is great. And then while well, I've, I've written a blog post uh, on for this whole presentation as well which is this last uh last link here which you can kind of 
take and absorb <laughs> at, at your pace if this was uh, too much information at once. So with this, I'll, I'll stop at this point and see if there are any questions. Um, so Diane, if you want to go ahead and open it up to questions, I'll, I can field anything right now. All right. Um, there are a couple coming in. Um, the, the first one, and um, Mike, I'm going to unmute um, Michael and um, Laura and um, El Michael there. Um, if you want to ask your question, that would be great. Um, Oh, cool. Thanks, Diane. Hey, Everett, how's it going, man? Um, Good, thank you. <laughs> I was just curious, uh, are you using the source, source to image binary tooling in here to create the images? Yeah. So, so do you mean like the, the S2I binary? Yeah, like that, that binary application, that project, you know, the, to do that, that work. So, so ultimately under the hood, yes. Yeah. Um, but we we didn't actually do any like so so as I understand it, and I'm not like super deep on on source to image, but but as I understand it, if you wanted to create a custom source to image, like a, a, a base custom source to image, um, you, you would need to use that binary uh, in order to build it out. We were able to use the uh, default um, source to image uh, base images that were provided by Red Hat for the .NET stuff um, and, and roll with those. So we didn't actually need to create any custom ones. So we didn't actually need to use that binary. Um, did, did that answer your question? Did I understand it correctly? Yeah, no, that definitely answers it. Thanks, it's, it's really cool. And, and you know, uh, I, I'd, I'll, actually, I'd like to caveat that with, you know, I, we, we, we kind of looked at doing a, a custom um, source based to image and you know, I, I found myself scratching my head at how you would actually run that on OpenShift itself, like creating that custom image, that custom source to image image um, itself on OpenShift. All of the examples I ever read had you doing it on like your your desktop or, or local environment in order, and then uploading that to OpenShift, um, which I suppose is, Okay, but I would I would much have much rather have it all run on OpenShift, but maybe I didn't really understand the process fully. Yeah, de yeah, definitely. It, it would be cool to kind of bundle that all in there. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Like, uh, hit me up sometime. We do. We have some tooling that we've been working on in kind of a oh, similar cool. vein with different base images and whatnot, where we do a lot of building inside OpenShift. Watch but, out! Oh, cool. I'll, I'll make him do a. a... A briefing on it sometime. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, uh, you walked right into Diane's trap. There you go. <laughs> not the first time. Not the first time. <laughs> yeah. Um. And and Laura had a question, and I was I think we were thinking something along the same lines too. So Laura, um, if you want to jump in here and and ask your question. Hi, Everett. Hey, Laura. So, question. Um, did you ever consider pairing OpenShift with Helm charts? Uh, or and tiller at all. I was just curious if that was an option you weighed. If you didn't go that way, why? If that was even an option. There. Yeah. So so certainly uh, and, certainly was and and yeah, yeah good question. Yeah, I'm going to um, add in there um, as well because we were we've been doing a lot of work around operators too. So and and using operators and I hadn't heard you mention that at all. So um, that might be a, a whole nother space too. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so in in short, short answer is kind of yes ish and yes ish. Um, <laughs> one of the the things that you know we were kind of I don't know about well well one of the principles we were kind of operating by is we wanted kind of the most vanilla open shift possible in in some sense um, without a lot of uh, customization. And so OpenShift doesn't come out of the box with Helm and Tiller. But they do have that templates thing. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we, we looked at templates first. And, and the reason we want to keep it vanilla is because, honestly, we're a really small team. Um, and, you know, in, in the, the market we're in right here, the, the skills aren't, aren't pervasive for, for OpenShift. You know, so if, if you hire someone for it, you know, you want to be able to hand them something that's pretty much out of the box, um, even though we've had to make, you know, a few tweaks here and there. That was one of the principles we were operating by. So, but back to, to Helm and Tiller. So yeah, we I looked at them, 
but OpenShift already had this, this templates thing. So templates was plan A based on that principle. And honestly, it was, it was enough. Uh, it, it worked, it was enough and it was simple. <laughs> templates is actually, I, I, one of the things I quite like about uh, OpenShift. Um, I, I know others have like various opinions, but honestly, it just, it worked for me. It's just like your most basic, simple templating solution, which is great. Um, you know, it's, it's probably even simpler than, than Jinja or, or some of the other templating solutions out there. In, in terms of operators, yeah, again, it, it, a matter of, you know, the, the vanilla thing worked for us, so, so we didn't have to look at something like that. I think if we were to get into um, deploying stateful services, I think that's when operators start showing a lot more value. Um, but all of these services were 100% were stateless. Um, you know, we, we managed to fob that off on that, that monolithic to be underlying the whole thing. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. And, and um, I don't see any other questions that if somebody does raise, raise their hands, but it, it's interesting to me because I, I, I do recall, I think you came out of Rackspace as well um, a while back, um, Everett, and I'm interested, um, and I don't know if, if other people are on the talk, but to, to figure out, I know like we use a lot of the same practices um, for OpenShift and stuff, lots of initiatives within Red Hat, like uh, Michael um, had uh, chimed in as well. But I'm wondering how much, and I would suspect a lot of enterprises are are you seeing adopting these methodologies um, today? Um, no. <laughs> Short answer. Okay. Yeah. So well, I mean, at at, at Rackspace, um, I'd never got into uh, the the OpenShift side of things so much. Kind of kind of started out with with Kubernetes and and doing a well, not started out but like kind of latter, latter in my career there, um, you know, working with Kubernetes a lot and, and hadn't quite evolved to the, the OpenShift space um, and, and hadn't really heard much of any of these kind of methodologies there. And, and here uh, in particular in, in the, the New Zealand market, um, yep, not, not so much at all. Um, this stuff is was was very new to certainly to the the client I was with and and honestly it was it wasn't a, I wouldn't say a, a, a fight to get it in but it was certainly um, you know the you know getting people to understand what I was trying to accomplish here was was non non trivial and honestly I was I was working through a lot of this stuff uh, myself because it, it had only been ideas and, and concepts up until this point. Um, and, and honestly, I, I, I credit, you know, a handful of the people at the client who were, who were really supportive and, and who helped me through a lot of this stuff, you know, like doing the, the hands-on work um, to, to really bring this, bring this thing to life. Um, so I, I wouldn't say that these methodologies are, are pervasive. There, there is a fair amount of open shift use in the market around here. Um, but yeah, this, this particular stuff, not so much. I, I think maybe after you left, um... Rackspace, because uh, we've worked really pretty closely with someone who is now again left Rackspace. Nothing about Rackspace. Um, <laughs> creates lots of opportunities for people. It's a wonderful place sure. to work. Um, but uh, yeah, Greg Swift had done a couple yeah. of talks for us, um, and you know, and I, Laura, Laura, I think I recognize you um, from doing some a lot of automation um, and your background. So uh, yeah, I am definitely talking about. Uh, Greg Swift, and he's, he's one of my um, favorite people because he's always on our Slack channel um, and helping other people, even now that he's over at Log DNA, I believe. But yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah Greg's uh, great. Yeah, so there's really some great people coming out of Rackspace and going into it, and um, and yeah. we, we we do love them, and we love the work you guys do and the con contributions you've made um, from all over the Commons universe, um, and so it's wonderful. So we're almost at the end of the hour. I don't see any other questions yet. Um, so I want to thank you for getting up at 7 a.m. your time. And um, if there's any final words you want to add in there, um, otherwise um, we'll post this video and the slides and links to his blog um, and all, all up on the openshift.com blog as well. So um, look for that um, coming soon. Anything else yeah. you want to add? No, no, just just my thanks to everyone for uh, for all your time and attention, and and this is the end for real this time. Yep. <laughs> Cheers. Thanks, Thank you very much, John and El Michael. I'm going to get you on that um, talk.
on source to image and things sometime soon. So watch out. All right. Take care, guys. Bye.